everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Source. I'm your host, Taylor Hudak. Now, earlier this week, Bolivia experienced a historic and notable election with the victory of Luis Arce, who was a part of MAS, or the Movement Towards Socialism. Journalist Ali Vargas has been on the ground covering the situation in Bolivia, as well as this most recent election. Ali is joining us now from the country's capital of La Paz. Ali, I want to thank you for joining me. No, thank you so much for having me on and helping, helping to shine a light on these issues. Absolutely. So before we get into this recent election, if you could provide the viewers with some context as to what took place last year during the 2019 election. Well, for 14 years, Bolivia was governed by a left socialist indigenous president, Eva Morales, who was elected three times and who in November of last, October of last year won a fourth, um, a fourth term. However, the country's neoliberal right refused to accept the result and a number of uh, violent protests broke out. Uh, people were attacking indigenous people in the streets, seeing them as representative of the left, of uh, indigenous mass supporters. That's Eva Morales' party, by the way, the, the mass the movement towards socialism. From there, what we had was an intervention by the US government, by the OAS, by figures such as Marco Rubio, who declared that there'd been electoral fraud in the elections that Evo Morales won uh, last year by, over, by just over 10%. There, the military, like, like throughout Latin America's history, the military intervened, took out Evo Morales and installed um, a really a far right government. And what we saw in the first days after Evo left was an outpouring of sort of racial sentiment that had been repressed for the past 14 years. We saw people in the streets burning the indigenous Wipala flag, we saw uh, attacks on indigenous people. And the, uh, in the moment in which Evo left, when the coup leaders took the palace, one of the coup leaders, Fernando Camacho, declared that you know, um, Jesus has returned to the palace and that never again will Pachamama, who's the indigenous god of Mother Earth, never again will Pachamama return uh, to this palace. So this was, uh, after 14 years of um, indigenous inclusion in Bolivia, of economic growth in Bolivia, thanks after rejecting recipes of the IMF, what we saw was an outburst of racist sentiment. Also, economic crisis for this past year that the uh, that the coup government has uh, ruled in Bolivia. What we've seen is Bolivia going from being the fastest growing economy in the region into an economic basket case. The, the economy has collapsed around uh, 11%. And that's a big, uh, the way in which the economy has collapsed compared to the impressive economic growth under Evo Morales is a huge, uh, probably the main reason for which the masses won such a stunning victory just a couple of days ago. From what I understand, since this coup, much of the economic progress and growth that was happening in the country under the Morales administration has been reversed. Is that a fair assessment and can you expand on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have to look at what Bolivia was like before Evan Morales took power in 2005. Uh, Bolivia was, as I mentioned earlier, the poorest country in the region uh, when Carlos um, Mesa was president just before Evo Morales. The country was taking out IMF loans to pay teachers' salaries, to pay the basic costs of the state. And that's obviously an incredibly dangerous situation for the country to be in, to be uh, you know, taking on debts that are not for investment, but for, you know, it's like for a private individual. If you're taking out credit card debts or uh, loans just to pay your bills, then you're in a very diff you're, that's a very perilous situation. Of course, if you take out loans to uh, invest, you know, set up a small business, things like that, that's an investment. There's very different things. And Bolivia was uh, in the former position. And everyone ran to take power in 2005 with Luis Arce, the, pres the current president-elect. He came in from the start as the economy minister, and they built an economic model based around the nationalization of natural resources and strategic industries. Using those profits from those the leading industries in the country, they go to the state, the state they invest that in development, infrastructure, uh, social welfare, public services. And that model 
uh, turn Bolivia into the fastest growing economy in the region, even after its export prices fell off a few years ago. It's still having growth of at least five, six, seven percent right up until the coup, which was uh, unparalleled anywhere in the region. But unfortunately, what happened last year when the coup government took over, they paralyzed the key state development projects, especially the um, the the industrialization of lithium, the industrialization of natural gas, in which Bolivia was beginning to uh, create the industrial capacity in which to produce sort of value-added products rather than just sort of exporting raw materials. They'd be creating uh, products like batteries and cars. That process has been completely paralyzed since the coup took over in November last year. Those factories, uh, the gates are closed. Um, and what that created even before the pandemic hit was an economic recession. And then when COVID-19 arrived, the government just imposed a total lockdown, a sort of rigid lockdown, without providing any support for the majority of the country who work in the informal economy. Uh, so people were left locked in their homes, starving. And of course, that destroyed consumer demand. When you don't have consumer demand, small businesses closed en masse. And now you have the situation where we have now unemployment has tripled. Uh, poverty is at the levels that there was before ever Morales, which is uh, an awful situation for the country to be in after so much progress. So. It's going to be incredibly difficult to rebuild from that. But we have to remember that Luis Arce, as economy minister, did rebuild from a disaster in 2005. So, as I understand, Luis Arce did win with 52 to 53 percent of the vote, and his challenger, Carlos Mesa, of the pro-coup right-wing party, had to concede the election. And you also stated in a tweet that, quote, Bolivia under an unelected government was an ally of the U.S., Bolivia under an elected government is not. Washington has not won the hearts and minds of Latin Americans, end quote. Can you speak to the significance of this recent election? I, the, it's hugely, it has regional and global implications, this election, because the fact that an anti-imperialist socialist party could win, could you know, come back to take power, after living through the most difficult circumstances, I think provides hope for people all around the world. The mass movement towards socialism, you know, it was a party that you know, the, the powers that be tried to disappear. They tried to jail their leaders, they massacred their supporters on at least two occasions. Uh, you know, huge political persecution to anyone that you know was associated with the party. But even amidst all of that, even amidst all of uh, those enormous obstacles. The party maintained its level of social organization on the ground, as to say, at the community level, at the workplace level, in the indigenous movement, in the unions. That organization, if any, is solidified during this past year. And on that basis, they were able to come back uh, and, and have this extraordinary victory. But I think in... Obviously, that's something that gives hope to people all around the world, in Latin America and globally. But also in concrete uh, implicate global implications, that there are lots. Bolivia now will completely reverse its foreign policy that it had under the coup government. Luis Arce said yesterday in an interview with the Spanish news agency EFE that they will, rest they will restore diplomatic relations with Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, and that they'll the country will turn back towards countries such as China and Russia after Bolivia you know, uh, reorientated itself towards the US this past year. So it's, it's incredibly significant geopolitically. I think people will be looking and peoples of the world will be looking to Bolivia and seeing what's happening and taking inspiration. So I think it's, uh, there's huge uh, regional and global ramifications. Now, you did touch on this fact earlier, but why is the United States so interested in this region in the world? Well, for, for over 100 years, the U.S. has seen Latin America as its backyard, as a region in which you can um, use the resources that are across Latin America to fund its own industrialization, its own development, and a region from which it can build a solid base in which they guard jealously. The whole Monroe Doctrine is based around the idea that no other country should have influence, um, you know, whether it be in the Cold War, the Soviet Union, today, China and Russia, 
so they they don't see Latin America as a sort of free and independent region that's capable of making its own decisions. And that's what we've seen, and um, not just in Bolivia, or they're trying to impose in Venezuela, in countries like Cuba, any country that turns away from from its father, from its master, is seen as something intolerable, abusive even. And that's why they, you know, where they can't win through the ballot box, they impose coups, they invade. And I think there's... Uh, his, you know, maybe political, sort of mainstream political commentators might say, well, you know, all this sort of anti-colonial discourse, maybe that's true in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but, you know, there's, uh, in a globalised world, what does that even mean? But I think the coup in Bolivia showed that all of those antagonisms, all of those sort of uh, issues of national liberation, issues of US intervention in the region, it's not a thing of the past. What happened in Bolivia was the U.S. intervened to impose a far-right government that suited its own interests, that had no popular support amongst Bolivian people. Uh, so I think there's the, those days of uh, the U.S. back coups, U.S. interventions, not a thing of the past. It happened just last year in this country right here. All right, Ali, why don't we take a short break, and when we return, we will be discussing the future of the country of Bolivia, as well as what took place on the ground on Election Day. But before that, check out this commercial break. Pure journalism. Every journalist in the world should have been cheering Edward Snowden. He did what every journalist is supposed to be devoted to. Because we have evidence that when we do that, things go wrong. Thanks for sticking with us and welcome back to The Source. I'm your host, Taylor Hudak. Now, Ali, I wanted to discuss what took place on the ground on Election Day in Bolivia, and I saw that the Gray Zone published a report depicting a heavy security and military presence in the country's capital of La Paz. This was a few hours prior to the polls opening. Is there a purpose for this, or is this a form of intimidation? Well, the, the current government in Bolivia has used sort of massive mobilizations of the military to intimidate people throughout this past year. Um, whenever there's been the threat of protest, they sort of put a thousand troops into the streets of the capitals the day before to try and scare people off. And that's what they did at the election. The night, of, the night of the elections, starting about 6 p.m. to about 11 p.m., uh, there's basically troops in the streets that, you know, training in the city centers of the big cities. And the Paz are sort of running up and down the street with their guns out, tanks flying up around the street. And that was just, a, you know, it's a form of intimidation, of course. And then on election day, the city here in La Paz was completely militarized. I'm not, you know, I'm, there's never been elections like this where you have, uh, you know, I saw in every plaza, every street corner, see riot police with tear gas rounds attached to their legs and they sort of massive guns out. Bolivia, of course, in every country, there's the presence of the police at, on, on election day to ensure that there are armed conflicts. But there's never been uh, scenes like that before uh, in Bolivia or indeed any other country I've, uh, I've been to. So, however, you know, it goes back to what I said before, the issue of how, you know, the strength of popular organization can sweep away even the most powerful enemies. Even though they had all the guns, they had all the, you know, the, the boots on the ground, at the end of the day, they didn't mean anything. At the end of the day, this, the momentum behind the left on election day was so strong that no one could deny uh, the victory that took place. No one could rig the election. Uh, you know, I think to, to commit fraud, electoral fraud, to rig an election is normally done by manipulating one to two, three percent uh, of a certain person's score. You can't manipulate 23, a gap of 23 percent or, or more. In fact, the official count is still going on now and it indicates that the mass is likely to have an even bigger margin. But, you know, uh, I think this, this should go to show people around the world. You know, I think movements in every country have had moments where it feels like the, the, the enemy is too powerful. It feels like, the, you know, the tasks are insurmountable. But here in Bolivia, there's, you know, <laughs> there's guns, there's boots on the streets, there's massacres, people were jailed, and people were still able to come together, organize, and win. <laughs> 
Now, I also want to touch on your experience reporting on the ground. You have uh, posted a few videos on Twitter that depicted some very erratic pro-coup right-wing supporters. But before we talk about that video, I want to play it for the viewers right now. Máxima atención. Ali, you were filming this video, I believe. Now, can you explain to me what exactly was happening there? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. I think on election day, um, despite a lot of concerns, it, it did mostly take place calmly, uh, freely. Uh, that's very important to say. However, I think the only irregularities we could say on that day was voter intimidation by right-wing groups. And I started the day going to vote with... Well, going to film Luis Arce, the presidential candidate, voting there. What we got was a number of people shouting. They threw eggs at us. We had three eggs throwing at the car we were in, throwing water, people challenging us to a fight. I was called a, a criminal and a delinquent for filming what they were doing. And then well, we, we went to uh, an area of the city called Satellite with the president of the Senate, Eva Coppa, and that's where we had the incident uh, you just shown. That wasn't the only incident, there's a number of incidents. What we had when we arrived, there was a very organized group who were not in line to vote, who we prepared the moment that she came in, Eva Coppa, who's you know, one of the most high profile people within uh, the mass. They all began shouting extremely aggressively, uh, we had throwing things. And when I began to film, uh, people became extraordinarily violent. Some people tried to take my camera, take my equipment, I had a press conference around my neck, people were sort of pulling that, I was punched in the chest. Uh, Instances like this woman just uh, coming in with a kind of uh, hate uh, that go, went to their very soul. And they were shouting with, you know, something, as I said, of a level of hate that I, I haven't seen very often. I've only seen a few times, I think, uh, in my life. But at the end of the day, you know, it's similar to what happened with the military. Despite all their intimidation, despite the, the aggression, the violence, the country doesn't belong to them. The country doesn't belong to that violent, far-right minority who, you know, who through desperation, after having lost the vote, turned to violence. Uh, so I think that, you know, we'll always remember that they are not the ones who, who represent the country, represent Bolivia. But we have to be quite vigilant, I think. Yesterday we saw a number of uh, protests in, in Cochabamba and Santa Cruz, basically trying to protest against the result. They're saying that mass, the mass should have never participated and therefore these elections should be cancelled. At the moment, they're just very small groups of extremists, like the sorts of people we just saw in that video. But we've got to keep an eye on that, ensure that it doesn't grow, ensure that there isn't a destabilization of uh, the democratic sort of transition here in Bolivia. Mass has requested the courts arrest former interior minister Arturo Murillo for his involvement of the massacres against the indigenous people of Bolivia. Now, not all of the listeners are aware of the situation regarding the indigenous people. So if you could explain more on what happened to them during this coup regime. Yeah, the first 10 days after the coup took place were um, so one of the most difficult moments in Bolivian history, the first 10 days, there were two massacres against indigenous protesters in uh, in Sacaba, which is in Cochabamba, and in the indigenous city of El Alto, which is sort of attached to La Paz. Um, and there were a couple of other smaller ones where one or two people died in Yapacani, Santa Cruz, Pedregal, here in La Paz. Overall, 34 people were killed for coming out onto the streets and calling uh, for the return of democracy, for the return of Eva Morales. And of course, throughout this past year, there's been no investigation, no justice for those people. In fact, the interior minister who we just discussed, when after the massacres took place, he'd come out in a press conference and say, um, you know, we want to denounce that protesters were armed and they shot themselves so as to make the government look bad, they're shooting their own people. Um, you know, the police and military didn't even have weapons, they didn't fire a single shot. Of course, the whole country, you know, it, in a way, that's almost what hurt the most, you know, to, to be insulted after having been shot. And 
a key demand of the popular movements that represent the mass is to have justice for, for those massacres. Arturo Murillo as interior minister is the person who ordered that. People also um, want to include in, in these sorts of charges the president herself, Hernina Añez, the minister of defense, Fernando Lopez, and a number of the sort of police commanders that were coordinating with far-right paramilitary groups. There are a number of what we'd call paramilitary groups, uh, far-right sort of shock groups, who were coordinating with police on the day during these massacres. You saw criminal gangs, motorbike gangs that would come out uh, without a uniform, but that were given weapons by the police and were allowed to shoot at the crowds. So I think there's... It's the most, you know, after the issue of the economic recovery, rebuilding the economy, it's the most important issue for people here. That there is justice for uh, the executions that took place. And, and I hope as well the international community, the United States government, all those uh, who were silent at the time can reflect on, on, on what they endorsed and what they supported uh, here in Bolivia. What are some of the challenges ahead? Well, as I said, the most number one, you know, challenge is rebuilding the economy after the disaster the coup government has left it in. Just days before the election, they took out a $300 million IMF loan. You know, why would they take that out if they're leaving power in a few weeks? They, they want to do that so as to saddle the new government with, with illegitimate debt that is very difficult to back out of, to try and lock in the neoliberal project that they've begun. Uh, the challenges are enormous um, in the issue of the economy, especially, as I said, the issue of justice for the massacres, but also the issue of rebuilding the democratic institutions of the country, the institutions of the state, or the, um, the police, the military, and clearly there's going to have to be some level of reorganization because this past year the military was reorganized. The, the number of promotions were, were carried out, uh, by the coup government, both in the police and the military, to place some sort of right-wing factions into the top positions. And then, you know, that's going to have to uh, be looked at, of course. There are There is a huge base of support within the military for the mass and, for the, and within the police. So I think the government is going to have to identify who those people are and ensure that they play a leading role in reshaping those institutions. And lastly, I want to make note that this victory is a result of the Bolivian people's protesting and demonstrating. Can you speak to the importance of people standing up to the government against oppression in order to ensure meaningful social and political change? Yeah, the, the democratic resistance, the popular movement in Bolivia has been going from the first day of the coup until, you know, two days ago when the victory was announced. There's never been a moment throughout this past year where people haven't been fighting. In early August, um, so I sh should add that these elections happen after they were delayed three times. The elections were supposed to happen on May the 3rd. Then they were delayed. They were supposed to happen in June, delayed again in September, delayed again. Because the government was trying to postpone because they knew they were behind in the polls. They didn't want to hold the elections. And the only reason the elections were held a few days ago was because there was a mass popular uprising in early August. Early August is when the regime uh, postponed the elections once again. And people thought, well, their intention is clear. They don't want to hold elections. And so we're going to have to come out to the streets and fight for that. And what we saw during that moment was, uh, it was extraordinary, I think. It's something that wouldn't happen in most countries. The movements, the trade union, workers' unions, indigenous groups in every single region, department of the country, went out and blocked the key highways in the country. Um, in the that was in the rural areas, in the sort of in the cities, the working class districts, so block completely blocked off uh, the key areas of the cities. So it completely brought the country to a halt. Um, there's a general strike, and that forced the government to provide guarantees, to set a date that cannot be moved, to provide guarantees. Also, it's put a fear into the government. And they saw what people were capable of. So they, they knew that if they tried to postpone again, they tried to rig the elections, they'd face an uprising even more intense. So it was, uh, it was crucial. And it was a movement that was much stronger than the resistance to the coup last November. This was a nationwide thing. 
So I think the the only way in which you know movements can can get something out of liberal democracy is by putting the sort of the fear of God into the, into the, into the powers that be. And that's what happened in Bolivia, and that's the only reason that people were able to go and vote a few days ago. Journalist Ali Vargas, thank you for your time today. And I want to thank you all for tuning in and watching this episode of The Source. Please make sure that you do subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you like the work that we do here, do donate to our organization to ensure that we can continue with nonprofit and independent news and analysis. I'm Taylor Hudak with Activism Munich, and I'll see you all next time.